Check Podcasts. Hi, I'm Bruce Williams. I'm CEO of the Greater Victoria Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to Chamber Chats, coming to you, as always, from the podcasting studios here at the Czech Media Group. I'd like to begin by acknowledging, as always, that I live and work in the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen-speaking nations, known to us as Songhees and Esquimalt. And Chamber Chats is made possible by the support of Island Savings, a division of First West Credit Union who have a team of experts with solutions as unique as your business. Solutions. We're all in the business of trying to find solutions. And among the solutions that we work with right now are ways of increasing our workforce. And we always know that probably the principal source of new workers for this country is immigration. And unless any of us are an indigenous person, we are all immigrants to this region. In my case, my family came here from Ireland two generations ago. So we've all, we've all got immigration in our past unless we're indigenous. So when those folks arrive here, they are made to feel welcome and they help to get settled in by organizations like the Intercultural Association of Victoria. We're going to talk today with the CEO of that organization and she is Shelley DeMello. Hi, Shelley. How are you? Hello, Bruce. I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the on Chamber Chats. Thank you for being here. So you meet somebody and they say, what do you do? And you say, oh, I run the ICA. And they say, cool. What's that? What do you do? What's your answer? Um, depending on who that is, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, written formal description of ICA is that we're in the business of supporting the full integration of newcomers, immigrants, and refugees from a social, economic, and civic life perspective in the capital region. Um, but I like to distill that down often to say that we're a conduit that we build bridges between the amazing contributions and life experiences that immigrants, newcomers, refugees bring to any region across Canada um, and the host communities that welcome them, that, that, you know, give them a place to call home. Yeah. Um, and that looks like many things that can look like, you know, access to school, access to work, access to various supports and, of course, community. And you do it very, very well, and you help enrich our community Thank by what you do. So the, so the people you work with, the, the immigrants, some of them are refugees too, I suppose. How do they yeah. find you? How do they source you? Um, a number of different ways. And I mean, you know, as, as immigrants, as, as newcomers come to the region, today's information sources, of, of course, are always the internet. And so there's website data. There's connections through Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Canada that would link you to us. But the truth is, it's word of mouth. It's on the ground work in communities and being able to be where um, newcomers and immigrants and refugees are. So um, it's not a linear connect the dots. It's just one pathway. Um, we often find that uh, it's it's reputational and and good word of mouth. So other newcomers, immigrants who have had services at ICA will recommend us to others who need those services. Yeah, I mean, it's very important, very impactful work. Um, how is it funded? How do you sustain? Well, um, two things. We are mainly uh, government funded um, at all levels of government. Um, immigration is is something that's decided at the federal level. Uh, our immigration levels are are decided at that level. And so our governments have a um, keen interest in supporting programs and services that help newcomers get a quick start um, that are able to integrate quickly. And integration, like yeah, I'm sure we'll discuss later, looks like different things depending on what the needs are. Um, but we also have a fairly engaged donor base and um, where our our government funding supports core programs and services such as settlement, language training, employment, child minding, child care, um, community connections. Our donor funds allow us to do innovative work. Um, so to bring uh, um to answer emerging trends, for instance, and so some of those things might look like entrepreneurship programs, and some of those might look like um, specific programs for women, so uh, women, youth, or seniors. Um, so it's it's a good mix, a good spectrum of supports that we see, um, but what can I say? It's never enough. 
the need is always greater than than our supply. So yeah, whenever we uh, talk with social service agencies like yours and the work that you do, we ask the question: What would happen if you weren't there? What if you were not there to provide this service to these people? What would that look like? I mean, I think human nature speaks to resiliency, and people do find their way. Um, but that means, you know, years and years of trying to navigate systems and structures and so on and so forth. And so an ICA comes in, um, I don't want to quite say parachutes in, but but exists to be that conduit to help unpack and explain, you know, why we do things the way we do in Canada and how you access systems and to translate um, maybe certain cultural norms to the norms that we experience or, or um, perpetuate here in Canada. I think there's other benefits to an ICA. So if we didn't exist, you know, um, can people find work? Can people learn the language? Absolutely. But an ICA helps that trajectory, like flattens out that trajectory or shortens that journey um, considerably. And, and that means many things for economies and the growth of communities. It means, you know, growth sooner, faster, quicker. Yeah. And growth. I mean, we, for us to grow our economy, we need immigration for those people to come here and fill those jobs. And you, uh, you do that, you help finding employment for these folks that are coming to Canada too. So what are some of the sort of unique challenges that uh, immigrants face when they get here looking for work? Um, there are many, uh, and they're not just, you know, um, something that immigrants need to solve or change or shift. I think it's a um, uh, a partnership in in terms of our host communities, our employer communities, finding ways to look at international experience and truly valuing that. Um, but it's also uh, true that you know newcomers need some kind of cultural competency and communications component. So language training is one of the biggest barriers that we'll find. Um, but I often say about language, I mean, there are certain professions where language and precise language, specifically, let's say in media or in broadcasting, where you need to, to have that very clear communication. But maybe it's more about functional communication. Can I convey what I'm trying to say in an effective manner as a, as opposed to a perfect grammatical manner. And we often test at that, that, that space for perfect grammar, perfect pronunciation, as opposed to con conveying meaning. And so language remains that bigger, the, that biggest barrier. I think another barrier, and I alluded to this already, is being able to um, assess the international experience of, of newcomers. Um, I'm often heard saying that the globalization ship has sailed. And what I mean by that is we're one global community. We may speak a different language, but our systems, our tech systems, our productivity systems, they all look similar. We're all using computers in this global age and in this digital age. Our um, our essential skills around numeracy, literacy, um, digital literacy, there's a level of acumen. And so when newcomers come to Canada attempting to access the labor market, what we often find is that maybe their past experience isn't quite valued the same way, despite this globalization of some of these productivity tools. Um, and then education may not always be easy to assess. And in the case of refugees, um, I can point to those who, who have left Afghanistan or who are highly educated, but in that area of war and conflict um, may not be able to bring their you know, documentation with them. There may not be a university out there that is able to quantify or qualify someone's international experience. And so when that refugee or that immigrant comes here and not able to produce some of those pieces, what else could we rely on? We could rely on things as, you know, a learned experience or that um, uh, uh, professional experience in their professions. 
So there needs to be that bridge, um, that translation, if you will, of that international experience to the Canadian marketplace. But as I said, globalization has happened, right? And so the systems that we use, um, the way we tackle uh, data, accounting, finance, even down to health, we're most likely using global equipment, global products, and global services. So um, it's not an insurmountable problem. No. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a lot to unpack in what you've just talked about there. Uh, and of course, once a newcomer gets here, they have to find housing. We're going to talk about that next. Our guest today on Chamber Chats is Shelley DeMello. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Intercultural Association of Victoria. Some misconceptions out there, Shelley, that uh, people coming new to Canada are using up housing that people are already here could have been living in. That's, that's kind of a misconception. Can you help me understand that a little better? Um, yeah, I, you know, Bruce, you and I have been around a bit. Yes. Um, and so the rhetoric, the, the tropes around immigration has changed over the years. And so I remember when I moved from corporate Canada and into the nonprofit sector, um, I was tackling, uh, at that moment, rhetoric around, you know, immigrants will steal our jobs or immigrants are lazy. And so um, I remember thinking, well, which one is it? <laughs> are they lazy or are they stealing our jobs? Because if they're stealing our jobs, they can't be lazy. And no. if they're lazy, they're not looking for jobs. So which one is it? And so today, um, you know, we're we're seeing some of that, those tropes again. And so we need to explain some of the social problems that we're seeing in our communities, housing, health care. Um, wondering why we are in in these moments of scarcity and sometimes uh those tropes help us easily um pinpoint someone who or some groups that might be an a, a reason for it but if if we peel back that onion a bit um it's not necessarily immigration that exasperates these social problems it's policy it's systems and so I don't mean to paint with a broad brush stroke, but, you know, decades ago, we dismantled Canada's national housing policy in favor of free markets, meeting demand for housing and expecting that demand, um, uh, expecting that supply will meet demand. Um, unfortunately, though, our population is aging. We've got labor shortages, um, fears that the economy will be stunted. Um, we've got other factors at play other than just increased immigration numbers that affect housing, uh, inflation, <laughs> and the cost of being able to borrow money or to finance a mortgage also creates exasperations to, to these systems. So um, I hate to use the term scapegoating, but immigration tends to be the scapegoat by which we, we often explain why society isn't working the way it is. And I think if we peel back that onion far back enough, um, we'll find that immigration, while yes, it's putting pressure on, on systems, those systems were, were, in, um, were in, in challenging moments anyway. And housing is an excellent example of that. And so I, I'd like to be the counter narrative voice here and say that it's not immigration only. Sure, demand is high, but we as a society um, have been uh, fighting this battle for decades. You and I have had this conversation in person and in some public sessions, and it's something that the Chamber is speaking very loudly about, and that is the federal government's decision to limit the number of international students that are coming to the country. We're going to talk about that next. Our guest on Chamber Chats today is Shelley DeMello. Shelley is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the Intercultural Association. Yeah, so the feds have suddenly come up with this idea that they're going to reduce the number of international student visas, Shelley. And a number of us were quite surprised by that because a lot of us felt that that wasn't really a very well-informed decision on, on the part of government. But that's going to impact post-secondaries with their budgets and their revenue. Uh, it's going to impact us in creating workforce because we won't have as many students. What else are you hearing around that issue? Um. 
again, you know, I use that term scapegoating. Uh, so forgive me here, but mm-hmm. there is a little bit of that again. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's always, there, there's more than two sides to a story and, uh, international students, if I can start from the place of an, you know, from, as, from an asset based lens, from an appreciative inquiry lens, um, contributes something like 20 some odd billion dollars to the economy per year. Um, and not only that, I mean, international students with their now um, Canadian based education, um, their global perspective, and therefore I- innovative practices that they can be bringing to, to Canada in terms of research and development innovation. I know I've said that already, but it makes Canada a much more competitive place um, and allows us to be better to deal with with competition, Um, uh, not just nationally or um, in North America, but also globally. Um, So I think to say we're going to put a cap on international students coming to Canada has some down the road impacts, like all policies do. Um, and we'll have maybe midterm to long-term impacts on our ability to be competitive as a nation, um, the ability to retain those international students as qualified, educated um, sources of, um, uh, of talent and, and experience to our labor markets. Um, so, yeah, I... I I kind of feel like it was a bit of a knee jerk reaction to some of the narratives, uh, again, around explaining why our social systems might not be up to snuff in this moment. Are there other ways to approach this? You know, Bruce, you and I have talked about this uh, um, in side chats and, and yeah, there, there are, but to, to curtail, you know, $21 billion of economic impact, um, seems <laughs> I'm going to be critical short sighted short sighted no I agree with you that, that that's yeah we're going to be speaking with the federal government about that but connected to that when you use the word scapegoating uh, that sort of has a tone of racism to it right that sort of activity is that and I know that you provide public ed- education around that for people who are immigrant and non-immigrant so yeah. I I'm a guy who doesn't understand racism I mean I, I kind of do and it it makes me sick but what sort of education do you offer for people that are are experiencing that or or believe in it well, I think, uh, you know, ICA's anti-oppressive, anti-oppression lens and our diversity, equity and inclusion work is a thread that that exists throughout all of our programs. And so it doesn't only show up in one part of our agency, it shows up in um, multiple spaces and places in everything we do. Um, and so we come at all of our work through an anti-oppression lens. And what that really means is, if I can take a step backwards in answering this question, um, that anti-oppression lens invites us in to look at our own decision-making processes critically. And we ask ourselves, well, there's many questions, but I'd, I, I'd um, siphon it down to four in this moment. And I'd say that um, we wanna ask ourselves, who are we including and why? And then the flip side to that question is when we design things, services, programs, products, um, invitations to participate, who are we excluding and why? And at the crux of those questions, when we answer them, we can unpack how we've made those decisions and why through that anti-oppressive lens. And then it's, it's pretty apparent where discrimination and racism falls through. And so ICA has had two responses to this, that we um, have been working with community members at an individual level, as well as with organizations, um, like-minded organizations who would like to shift their organization cultures, their organize, you know, look at organization behavior and organization development from uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. There's lots already said about the benefits to diversity in a workforce. Again, organizations, businesses can move faster, quicker because they are more competitive 
because of that diversity. But inclusion is is really the crux of it, right? And so um, why do we exclude people? Um, and if it is because of racist or discriminatory practices, and we ourselves intentionally want to make um, changes to be more of a welcoming community to create senses of belonging, then we've got to crack that nut. So the two programs I, I mentioned, um, one is the bystander or upstander training, and that works with community members on an individual level um, to unpack conflict and how we can have open dialogue. We're all different. We all have preferences, but discrimination and racism isn't preferences, and there's a distinct difference. And, and it really lies in who are we excluding and why? Um, or maybe it lies in who are we including and why? Um, and so they go hand in hand. And that bystander training really um, helps us as individuals unpack maybe some unconscious bias, um, you know, some maybe passive aggressive thoughts or behaviors because of past experience and allows us to um, uh, explore some tools and resources for helping us show up for each other in different ways as we meet um, in community. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, as we move away from more an individual approach uh, with the bystander upstander training, we have our tools for equity training and, and programming. And that's where we work with organizations and teams who have intentions of embracing uh, a DEI lens, a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. We help support through maybe a one-on-one on DEI so people can dip their toes in the water and get comfortable. Um, and then we work very intentionally with those business owners or organization leaders to um, help them develop policies that are inclusive, that celebrate diversity, um, and that allows for safe spaces for that to happen. We have run out of time, which means we're going to have to do this again because we didn't get to a lot of what oh, we were going to talk about today. Yeah, I do want to quickly mention though we're doing something with uh, ICA and VERCS, which is the Vancouver Island Refugee Centre Society. It's something called the New to Canada Fund. So a newcomer who's been here for three years or less and is coming here for the purpose of buying or starting a business, they can draw from that fund to get free membership into the Chamber of Commerce for two years, which will then connect them with the greater business community and give them every chance to succeed. So if you want to find out more about that, you can contact me and I'll tell you all about it. Shelley, Mello, thanks for your time. Thanks for all you do. And I really do want to do this again soon. Wonderful. Thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate you having me on the show today. And thanks for all you do. Shelly DeMello is the Chief Executive Officer of the Intercultural Association. And I'm Bruce Williams. We'll see you again for another Chamber Chat. Mm -hmm.